The things I want to look at today is, first of all, what is soil carbon and what can and can't be counted, how to measure carbon in a counting ca carbon accounting context, some of the factors that control carbon content, and impact on management of management practices on soil sort of organic carbon, and I'll finish up with a summary. But just before I start into that, I guess there's two pieces of soil carbon accounting is going to be a rules-based system, and it's going to be rules-based because it's been brought in by government. It has to accept, some things have to be accepted because we want the carbon accounting to be recognized internationally. So some of the rules might seem a little odd, but they're there because of international requirements. Two pieces of legislation have been brought into play that have made this all possible. One is that companies that are producing large amounts of CO2 equivalents are going to have to start uh, providing credits back to the government to offset those emissions. And the Carbon Farming Initiative has been started, which is going to allow landholders to potentially capture carbon. Now, when you're looking at soil carbon, and the same comments can be applied against trees, they differ from things like nitrous oxide and methane. Nit reductions in emission of nitrous oxide and methane are immediate. They happen right away. You can get credits right away. Soil carbon and carbon in trees has to have a permanence rule because we're tucking that carbon away in a stock. And right now, it looks like it's going to be a 100-year permanence rule. So, with those things in mind, we've created a demand from the companies, we've created a market, uh, sorry, a supply chain, and so we've got potentially a market for carbon trading. First of all, having to think about what soil carbon is, and if you look at a paddock, what sort of forms of carbon do you see? The first is the crop residues that you'd see on the soil surface. We also have big pieces of crop residues buried within the soil matrix. As we start decreasing in size, you start to get smaller bits and pieces of plant materials. And when you decrease in size again, you're really starting to look at organic molecules stuck onto mineral particles. The last form of carbon that we look at, we call it resistant carbon. In an Australian context, it tends to be dominated by charcoal. Now just to show you a few pictures, we're pretty familiar with the things at the top of that list. Down at the bottom, you can look, when you look at these particulate organic matter fractions, they actually look and they still have tissues and structures that make them look like they came from plant material. As you start to move across into this more humified or this humus carbon, these angular bits are all the soil particles. You no longer see these structures, but it's more these molecules stuck on the surfaces. The charcoal, just bear in mind, this is 20 microns, so 0 0.02 millimeters. A lot of our highest carbon, sorry, our highest charcoal content soils, you can't see charcoal. It's not like lumps and chunks associated with fires that we would see in a fireplace or after a, after a forest fire. Most of our soils that are high in charcoal come from old grasslands, and the charcoal is very fine and not able to be seen. Now, when you look across these different fractions or these different forms of carbon, the stuff at the top is highly decomposable. It turns over in a matter of a year or two. The stuff at the bottom is very resistant. Residence times for charcoal or ages tend to be in the thousands of years. What that means then is when we think about carbon accounting, these things are treated differently. For a soil carbon accounting, we're really looking at the sum of those materials there, the, three, the bottom three fractions. The top bits are not usually included in soil carbon, and you could ask why not, and it's basically because of their transient nature. If we were to grow a, a, a fabulous crop this year, put 10 tons of stubble down, lots of people ask me, why can't I count for that carbon? And the main reason is that another year or two, it'll all be gone. And then the next crop grows and it, it fixes more carbon. If we were to put those into the carbon trading scheme, what you'd be doing is introducing a whole bunch of volatility. Um, this year you got 10 tons of stubble, next year you got 4, you'd actually have to relinquish carbon credits. The year after that you got 8, you'd have to you'd go and get some more carbon credits. So by focusing on the longer lived forms of carbon, it takes that volatility out. How do we measure it? First thing is, you've got to define the area of interest, you've got to go and collect multiple samples out of it, and those samples have to be to a minimum depth of 30 centimeters. They can go deeper, but the minimum depth is 30 centimeters. You need an accurate, accurate estimate of soil bulk density. Carbon trading is done in tons per hectare, so it's a unit mass of carbon per unit area of land surface. To take our soil carbon measurements from a lab and convert them into an area basis, we need bulk density. You can't get away without doing that. 
We also need an accurate measure of the soil carbon content. Most labs that have uh, uh, an analytical capability can do this quite accurately. I just suggest that you, if you're submitting samples for carbon analysis, look for something like ASPAC accreditation to make sure that there's some sort of scrutiny over the analyses that are being employed. The analytical equipment, when run right, is fantastic. Very low errors. To calculate the stocks of carbon, then, we take depth times bulk density times carbon content. And I'm throwing this last one on. Um, most labs will sieve the samples to two millimeters. That's what we, if you remember back, that's the bit that we're going to include in soil carbon fractions anyways, or in soil carbon accounting anyway. What this does is allow you, in soils that have lots of gravel, you can take that gravel out prior to the analysis. But when you're doing your soil carbon content, if you've measured it on the less than two, you've got to bring a correction back in for the gravel content. The other thing that's going to be really important in moving forward in soil carbon accounting is the quantification of the level of confidence we have in the values. And I'll put a bit more up on this in a second. But basically it involves the errors associated with measurement, but probably more importantly the errors associated both through time and space. So we go into a paddock and we measure here. It could be quite different from somewhere else within that paddock. So we've got to bring that spatial variability and the variability through time into play. So how do we do that? If I use this sort of white box, the outline as being a paddock or the area of interest that I want to go and get my carbon sample from, all those blue dots are say 10 random positions where I've gone and sampled my soil car, or, sorry, extracted the carbon from the soil, extracted the soil, sorry. From those values we can get the average and, the, and an estimate of the variability associated with the soil carbon content at that point in time, that's our baseline value. We do the same sometime in the future, again, getting both the average and the estimate of variability. It's very important to get that variability, which I'll show in a minute. With those together, we can then calculate the average and the estimate and an estimate of the variability of the difference between them. If we had have composited all those samples, so we had just one sample in the first one and one sample at the second time, we have no idea what the variation is, and we can't say, or we have no idea what the variation associated with the difference is. If we do it this way, what it allows us to do is look at, at, at this last, into, we can look at the, the, the confidence in two ways. First of all, let's look at this first point. If I hadn't kept the sample separate, all I would know is there's a value of 10 tons. How do I trade that? If I have absolutely no idea about how confident we are in that number, how do I put that on a market? Am I exposing myself to huge risk by doing that, or am I being very conservative? By putting the error terms on it, we can start to get a much better idea about how to trade it. We can also use this data in another way, and that is to say that 75% of the time we, have, we will get at least two tons of carbon or less as the difference between these. So you can start putting it on a market with a degree of confidence, both from the buyer's and the seller's point of view. Now, just a really quick calculation to sort of give an indication of what a change in soil carbon really means. And if you're given an example of one, does it make sense? On this graph, I've got, on this axis, the tons of carbon per hectare that exist in the soil and the soil bulk density. And each of these lines corresponds to a different level of carbon in the soil, 1% through to 4. Now, if I was to say, I want, someone has told me they've shifted their soil carbon content from 1% to 2% in the top 10 centimeters over a period of five years, what does that really mean? Well, at a bulk density of 1.2, we've got 12 tons of carbon. We shift it to 2%, we've now got 24 tons of carbon. That means somehow, over that five years, I'd have to find a mechanism for putting an additional 12 tons of carbon into that soil. And that's potentially over and above what you've currently done, because what you're doing right now has got you to that point. So if you want to move from there to there, you've got to find that extra carbon. So if you run through these calculations, so the amount of carbon required is 12 tons. Biomass is roughly half carbon, not quite, but roughly. So we're looking for, over that five-year period, we're looking for an extra 25 tons of dry matter. If we assume then that half of the carbon captured by a plant is directed below ground, and that's a very rubbery number, and the things that Ian showed you is exactly what we need to firm up these kinds of numbers to know how much carbon is being directed below ground. 
But let's just assume 50% is going below and that none of that carbon, absolutely none of it, is lost due to decomposition. That would tell us that every year we'd have to see an extra two and a half tons of above ground dry matter production and all of that carbon be returned to the soil and none of it decomposed to support that 1% to 2% carbon change over a five year period. If we then say that 50% of that carbon is lost by decomposition, and that's conservative, it would probably be bigger, we're now looking at a number of about five tons. So the question then comes, to shift carbon from 1% to 2% in the top 10 centimeters, you've basically got to find, over five years, you'd have to find approximately an extra five tons of dry matter production per year in each of those years to substantiate that. So if you start to see claims of this sort of magnitude, I just go back and ask, where's the production data to support the higher levels of carbon acquisition and deposition in the soil? If you divide those numbers by 10, Instead of the five tons of, of dry matter, you need to get down to, say, 0.2. And you'll see in a minute, you're starting to get into the realm of what we think or what we've measured through temporal measurements of soil carbon change under management. Now, I'm going to put two slides up now that sort of go through a bit theoretically another couple of issues that you're going to want to be very careful about when looking at soil carbon. The first one is relative differences. And this is the way most data, or a lot of data, around soil carbon is expressed. Let's say this was a trial and we've got two treatments, treatment one and treatment two. We find that there's 25 tons of carbon difference between those two. Does that mean that treatment two is sequestered 25 tons? Absolutely not. We can't tell whether either of those treatments are sequestering carbon because we don't have temporal data. We don't know. They could both be going up, they could both be going down. What we do know, however, is there's a difference between them of 25 tons. If this was across the paddock, across a fence line comparison, the other problem we have is we don't know if they started off at the same place. We just know that at this point in time they differ. When you're going into soil carbon trading, you need to get temporal data. We need to get data that says, at a baseline position, we have potentially increased soil carbon, or carbon has decreased. Now, Typically, if this is the business as usual scenario, and then we want to bring a carbon friendly practice into play, that would be the relative difference, the same sort of thing I expressed back here. The two absolute differences are these. So this is the absolute, the sequestration that's happened. This is called avoided emission. So if you can track the business as usual scenario, as well as the, car the carbon change associated with the management change scenario, there is, there may be some, we don't know yet, but there may, you may be able to, to uh, also trade on the uh, avoided emission. The second sort of theoretical bit that I want to run through is, is just issues about what we call saturation and permanence. And this is data from the Rothamsted Research Station in the UK. I use it because it's the longest running trial where we've got soil carbon values. Right back into 1860, Prior to that, they started archiving soil samples. You can go back and grab the samples from these treatments. The light blue is growing barley year after year, no change over the whole course. The bright blue manure was applied at the beginning and then stopped, and the red manure was applied and it still continued to be applied at the same rates. Now the dots are measured points and the lines are models. There's a few points that this brings home for us. First thing is, to get to to the value that soil carbon would, would attain under a given management scenario is going to take a long time. And the biggest changes occur at the beginning. So can we think that this change that we see back here is going to keep going on and on? No, you have to be very careful that you don't misinterpret an initial change to a change that's going to carry on every year, year in, year out for the next, for the next while. The second point is that the capacity is finite. Our soils can store more carbon, most of them can, but they can't continue to store carbon. Um, they'll eventually reach a new equilibrium value, which is a function of what the inputs of carbon are. And I'll go into that a bit more in a minute. And the last point is if you've somehow managed to create an increase in soil carbon through some change in management, if you stop that change, the soil will revert back to what it was before. So once you've, the, the implication of this is you change your management, you build carbon, you trade that carbon, you now have a liability to maintain that carbon, 
If you change your management again, you're going to have to be very careful about what the implications that might be on soil carbon values. Okay, we did a review uh, a couple of years back now on the Australian uh, scientific literature to look at how much carbon could be accumulated, or sorry, what was the relative difference in soil carbon values due to implementing different management practices. The management practices are here, states along this axis, and to cut right to it, the, the data is suggesting that changes on the order of 0.1 to 0.5 tons of carbon per hectare, which all fall in that light blue box, are probably pretty realistic. There are values below that and there are values above that. I have to acknowledge though that this was done on data that's been published, so some of the more recent uh, changes in carbon that people may be observing aren't included in this. And it may be that there are other practices out there that can do better than this, but so far what's been published is telling us somewhere around about that 0.1 to 0.5 tons of carbon per hectare per year. If I then look at the absolute rates, and there weren't very many studies in this whole group where you could look at absolute rates, in other words, changes through time. But when we did, the, what the data is suggesting is the cropping systems were still going backwards. In other words, they were losing carbon. They were doing better. Uh, the reason they have positive relative changes is they were doing better than the business as usual, but they still weren't sequestering carbon. And the conversion from crop to pastures uh, always gave a positive sequestration. Just to put this in the context of international, um, are these numbers of 0.1 to 0.5 reasonable? This was a review done by a Canadian in this case across uh, all the data they could put together from around the world and that yellow bar is, or that yellow box is the 0.1 to 0.5 tons of carbon per hectare per year. Very consistent with what we found within the Australian data. We've been involved in, in a soil carbon research program that's had funding from GRDC and DAF over the last uh, two and a half years. And I'm just going to run through a couple of, oh, first of all, what our objectives were and make a few comments about that. The first one was to apply a consistent methodology for quantifying carbon across the country and to do that on a regional basis. Now, we haven't been able to do all regions and all cropping systems, but we're starting to get together a pretty extensive database across the country with this. We've used the exact same sampling protocols everywhere, so everything is comparable. One of the big challenges we had in going through that scientific literature was everybody did their soil carbon sampling in a different way. And to try and bring that all together in a consistent manner was very difficult. I'll put a couple more results up about that in a second. We've also collected some temporal data for validating a model called FullCam, which is what our national inventory is built on. We've been looking at mid-infrared as a rapid means for quantifying the amount of carbon in soil. Absolutely brilliant in terms of its ability to quantify carbon content. It has shown us as well that you need regionally specific calibrations to get the best results out of it. We're still working on a means and its ability to actually quantify the composition of carbon. Hopefully more on that in the next couple of months. Um, in terms of quantifying the inputs of carbon under perennial pasture systems, we've had two projects running. The quick answer to that is if the carbon stocks have been run down through to, uh, due to uh, cropping or other, other management practices, perenniality, where it can be brought into play, actually is a nice mechanism, especially the perennial pastures, can put a lot of carbon back into the ground quickly. But they put the more labile forms back in quickly. And you've got to, that then needs to be converted over to the more hu this humus stuff we call, otherwise it's subject to loss. And the last thing we've looked at is a couple of automated devices for testing bulk density. They're basically uh, the equivalent of uh, neutron probes used in soil water analysis. They, are, they're they were designed to do road-based testing. They've been working quite well. Uh, if anyone wants some details about that, I'm not going to enter it into the talk today, but I'm happy to, to let you know what we've been finding. Now, just to go back and think about, and I'll show you a couple results of some of the regional soil carbon values we've come up, come up with. And just to explain this graph, soil carbon content on this axis, um, divide those numbers by 10 to get to percents. And then the height of each of these bars tells you what proportion of the, the farms or the paddocks we sampled fell into that class. 
So that's saying there's a few farms or a few paddocks that we sampled with carbon contents around 2.5%. Uh, the majority of them are around between the 1 and 2%. Now this data comes from South Australia across a pretty heavy rainfall gradient and covers both con everything from continuous cropping through to continuous pastures. A couple comments about it. One of the things is that in this region, on the soil type that we looked at, some of the farmers have been achieving quite high carbon contents. Whether that's a, a, an effect due to rainfall or it's an effect due to the management practice still needs to be nutted out and that'll be our goal over the next few months. But what we've got now, if, if I was a policy person and I wanted to try and invoke some policies that would uh, indicate where soil carbon values might go or a Department of Climate Change might be able to take this data now from real farms, from real paddocks and say through the mid-north of South Australia this is the distribution of soil carbon values we have. The other thing it can do is a farmer who may not know, or may have measured his carbon content, but doesn't know where he sits in terms of the region, Co could go into a distribution like this, and if he plots up here, then he knows, you know, we're already up towards the higher end of the soil carbon values. Maybe there's not a lot of space for me to go. If, however, they're down here, they may be able to say, okay, look, there's evidence for being able to move soil carbon values. We still need to understand a little bit more about how to move the soil carbon values, whether it's a management or a climate effect, but at least it says, yes, there is room to move. And the other thing, if we take that to its sort of logical conclusion is, can we shift what these farmers are doing, shift their management regime to push them up? This is just a second example from Esperance in WA. And I guess I'll put this up because it staggered me when I started to see carbon <coughs> content three and a half, four and a half, even to five percent on the sands around Esperance. And basically in the long run what it's panning out is these are the old Kaikuyu pastures with a rainfall close to the coast with high rainfalls. So look, it's, it is telling us that in areas we can, you know, if anyone I think would have thought of, of Esperance sands of having five percent carbon, I wouldn't have, but they do. They can, sorry, they can. What determines carbon content in a soil? It's really a function of inputs and outputs. And if I'm going to use this bucket as an analogy, and, and I'll start from a small bucket, a sandy soil, the size of the bucket increases as the amount of clay goes up, so we know our clay content soils can hold more carbon than sands. We've got two parameters to look at. How much carbon we're putting in, that's a function of net primary productivity, how much carbon can be captured by plants. If you're fortunate and you happen to be close to a waste stream, you may be able to bring some of that carbon onto the farm. But the other one that's probably just gaining a bit of acceptance now is nutrient supply. Carbon in soils is not there on its own. It's associated with nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, oxygen, and hydrogen. You can't build carbon without building all the rest of them. We've measured across soils from less than 0.5% in the Mallee through to 55 6 6% around Hamilton. The C to N ratio is constant. What that means is you've got to have a nutrient supply there to build carbon. We tend to fertilize to what crop demand is. We don't fertilize to what the soil would also need if it's going to leave a build soil carbon values as well. And by fertilize, I better be careful. I don't mean we have to add bag fertilizer to increase soil nitrogen. We can use legumes. There are other approaches that can be used as well. On the losses side, decomposition is always occurring. We want to try to figure out ways to slow that decomposition down or to minimize it. Equally, we want to minimize erosion. Those are our two main losses of carbon from systems. So what we want to do in our agricultural systems is design ways to increase the inputs and reduce the losses. And if I was to, if I'm asked, you know, where can we go to build carbon? The first thing I'd be doing is saying, what soils out there are not achieving the maximum carbon capture that they could achieve because they're not using their resources in the most efficient way, or their resource use is not being maximized. And the easy one to look at probably is water use efficiency. So where out there is the water, our water use efficiency is low? The next question you have to ask, is there a management strategy that we can invoke to bring that water efficiency value up? And if there is, and we implement it, then we might be able to grow more carbon, return more carbon to the soil, and have soil carbon values go up, even within the production systems we're currently in. So I'm going to break this down into two chunks. The first one is we want to maintain our current production system. 
Our goal should be to maximize resource use efficiency. It should be your goal anyway from an agronomic point of view. That could be the amount of carbon captured per millimeter of water. We want to maximize carbon retention and return to the soil, so we want as much of that carbon to stay on the, in, the, in, the, in the paddock as possible. We want to ensure our nutrients that are required not only to grow the crop but to build the carbon are there somehow, whether it's fertilizers or whether it's implementing legumes in rotation. And some examples of how we might be able to um, maximize, improve that resource effic use efficiency are liming, fertilizers, rotational grazing. Now, one point to make, if you build carbon you're not, and you're not going to be able to trade all of what you build if you've done it by adding nitrogen and you've, ex you've got some nitrous oxide emissions or you've stocked it up and you've got methane emissions. The trading will require a net balance between all emissions. I'm going to get a bit provocative here and um, it's really important that the economics been put across everything in the long run and the balance between uh, the value of carbon and the value of the production that you may forego to leave more carbon behind has to be assessed. But first of all, you might be able to introduce perennial vegetation. There might be alternative crops with lower harvest indices. Now, our breeding programs are going in the opposite direction and they should be for production point of view. But if we're trying to build carbon and carbon has an acceptable value, then we may want to be breeding to moving back some of the varieties with, with lower harvest indices to leave more carbon back in the paddocks. We might look, want to look at pasture species that put more carbon below ground than currently do. And probably the last one, which I think has a place already, um, in areas where there's gross, negative gross margins in a paddock, should we be locking those up as the carbon bank of the farm and taking the resources that we're currently allocating to those areas and putting them back into the more responsive parts of the farm? So just to summarize, I think absolutely soils have a place in carbon accounting. We should be building carbon because of all the benefits carbon gives to the soil in the first place and the improvements we would get in our production systems. But it does have a place in carbon accounting. However, it won't be the answer to all of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. We know that many of our soils have lost carbon under agriculture. It tells us they can hold more carbon. The challenge is how do we balance the carbon input versus the losses and keep the agricultural production system running as hard as we can. And, and Ian gave a couple of nice examples of things that might be coming into play in the future. We know that the capacity of our soils to hold carbon is finite and the largest changes occur early. So, and if we do build carbon and we enter into carbon trading, we build it, we've got to keep it or we've got to pay for its loss into the future. The relative increases that we've seen in the literature are typically less than half a ton per hectare per year. And the absolute increases in, in the literature we searched are negative, often negative for cropping systems, and often or always were positive for conversion to grasslands. Where do opportunities exist to capture carbon? And I guess that's where we can identify inefficiencies in our current production systems and we can remove them through management. There's probably a lot of alternative systems out there with high carbon capture per increment of resource use, but the prerequisite against you know, both of those statements is going to be, can we do it in an economically viable way so the farm business can continue to be maintained? A key point, and I may not have emphasized this enough on the way through the talk, there's not one solution. What works in one place may not stand a hope of working in another place. It's going to be dependent on the soil types, on the climate you have, it really worries me when a, a nice change in soil carbon has been, been found and the next step that's done is it's put across all of Australia's agricultural region and all of a sudden we've got this huge ability of soils to sequester carbon everywhere. To think that something that works, say here, is going to work in the Mallee, there's, we just don't know. You can't make those sort of assumptions. You need to tailor your management solutions to building carbon to the soil you have to work with and the climate that you have to work with. I guess I'll finish on, I think, uh, on what I think are a few of the constraints in all of this. The first one is farmers are paid to remove carbon in their products. They're, our breeding programs around grain and around meat are, are all around getting as max, the maximum conversion of the carbon captured by the plant into a product that then goes out the farm gate. 
Are we expecting, how, do we, how can we expect car, uh, farmers to put more carbon back into the soil when we're paying them to take that carbon away? I guess the introduction of a carbon trading program is the first step towards that. It'll be interesting to see how the balance between commodity prices and the soil carbon values go through time. There will be future liabilities and, impl and potentially implications on land, land values because of this. If you go into carbon trading, you acquire your carbon credits and you sell them, you now have a liability to maintain them. The interesting thing is if you keep them, they're actually an asset, they have value. You don't have a liability until you sell them. So if you get your carbon credits and you just keep them, if you're found later on that you don't have as much carbon in the soil as you thought, you can hand them back. But whilst you haven't traded them, they're an asset. One of the few things that I, I can think of that does a 180 degree flip the moment it's sold. There's going to be uncertainty still in the value of carbon in the agricultural products, so any economic modeling we do now has to bring that risk into play. And we still have some challenges with respect to measuring, particularly the spatial and temporal variability, and that's where a lot of our research is headed in the future, hopefully from the point of view of being able to inform on what, inform on what the likely outcomes are with degrees of risk associated with them. And with that, I thank you and just acknowledge the sponsorship that our work's had from Department of Climate Change, DAF, and GRDC. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, um, with regards to your uh, classification of particulate carbon, the humus, and um, the uh, charcoal residues, Briefly, could you just explain how one transforms to another to another? Uh, uh, sure. Am I correct that you can start with uh, particular carbon and end up with charcoal? And what would be the pathway of that? Sure. And, and when you get to charcoal, so what? Um, yep. what, what does that mean? Okay, I'll, I'll have a, a go at that. Um, basically, there's a cascade through, we, we start with our that, those first series of, of fractions that I put up, excluding the charcoal one for a minute, is basically a de decay sequence. Uh, as we move through the soil, we start with these big pieces of plant residue. They basically start breaking up and get converted into smaller pieces. So our particulate, sorry, the particulate carbon is basically just the bits and pieces of plant residues that have been partially decomposed. All right, so that's that one. The humus, when the microbes and the animals are decomposing that carbon, some of that gets converted into the bodies of those organisms, into materials which those organisms exude back out into the soil. That stuff gets stuck onto soil particles. That's what's dominating our, our more humified or humus type carbon that we talk about. The charcoal has a com is completely unlinked to both of those, cas that cascade of decomposition. The charcoal is induced by fire. We have found that the majority ex with the ex possible exception of the cane soils, where there's such vast amounts of burning, sorry, of biomass burnt per year, that the, what we've done since European settlement hasn't really, sh we don't think it's shifted charcoal values significantly. Our highest charcoal content soils are soils from historic grasslands. They were grasslands before European settlement here. The charcoal dates to five to seven, sometimes 10,000 years old. So it's not really what we've done, it's stuff that's in the soil already. What's the significance of knowing that? And, and I should have said this in my talk as well. You don't need to know the allocation to fractions to trade carbon. What the allocation to these fractions gives you is a sense of how vulnerable that carbon is to change. If we knew that our soil carbon value was composed, and I'm going to push the numbers a long way, let's say it was 75% of the carbon was this particulate stuff. Well, we would have a soil that has carbon in it that's very vulnerable to change in the future. If we did something and we turned the input tap off, we're gonna lose a lot of carbon fast. If on the other hand, we knew that 75% of our soil carbon was charcoal, that, wouldn't, that change would, be, would, would happen a lot more slowly. We wouldn't lose that carbon. If it was humus, the same thing compared to the POC. So what the, what the fractionation tells us more so is uh, how vulnerable the carbon that we've been able to build or may be able to build is how vulnerable it is to change as we move forward into the future. Does that hit everything you asked? Yep, okay. Um, Jeff, is there a way that we can 
the increases in personnel, sort of cases like the Tories, and I guess people actually monitor the sort of accounting that would be go for. Yeah, I, so if I understand the question right, is has there been an increase in the number of tests that labs are doing for soil carbon? Well, no, more um, has there been any modelling that if there is a price carbon that we actually have the people and the... Uh, do we have the capacity to deliver the, 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 the rate of analysis that may be, that may come in line in response to carbon trading? Um, as far as I know, there hasn't been, but I can't, I, I couldn't confirm whether it's been done, C certainly not by us, but whether it's been done somewhere in the government, I couldn't tell you. Um, I think it, it would depend on how fast everyone jumps on the soil carbon bandwagon, if you want to call it that. Um, there are, I just went, through, we've just gone through a, an ASPAC certification and I know there's 20 some odd labs around the country that have that certification. Um, I couldn't tell you what the throughput of samples for all those labs is. Um, I suspect if, if it got going in a very big way, there would have to be a very quick scaling up of capacity across the country. And absolutely there will have to be a scaling up if we want to do carbon composition as well as total organic carbon values. Um, Jeff. With your talk there, you're mixing up a lot of things as value in carbon. I uh, just read recently where our government, one of our sponsors here, values at $23, but on the world um, it's trading at between $7 and $9. Um, when you're actually trying to make money out of farming, you have to get a return on your investment. Is it worth trying to increase your soil carbon when it's not going to increase your yield or anything, but you're looking at increasing the value of your land and maybe the potential to trade that value. I'm just wondering what is the true value of carbon? Absolutely, that's a great question and something I probably should have made a couple comments about. Um, and one thing just while you were talking that reminded me that I should have also said is there's a difference between carbon and CO2 equivalents and the multiplication factor is 3.67. So if in, in greenhouse gas counting speak, it's often used as CO2 equivalents. The values that I was putting up were changes in carbon in tons of carbon per hectare. If you want to bring them to the CO2 equivalents, you've got to multiply them by 3.67. So that's the first thing. In answer to your question, I, I think the thing that we're missing in, in our economic modeling of changes in soil carbon is quantitative expressions of what a change in soil carbon will do to the productivity. And by quantitative, I mean being able to take it all the way to a grain yield number. We, we have, um, for lack of a better word, more warm and fuzzy feelings that increasing soil carbon is good. We have some evidence in particular places that increasing carbon can alter the water retention curves that Ian was talking about and may be able to make more water available for plants. If that's the case, we can take that through all the way to a production benefit. Um, as an example, in the mid-north of South Australia, going from 1% to 2% carbon, we would project an average increase of water holding top 10 centimetres to hold an extra 3 mils of water. If that happened every time it rained, and let's say it rained 10 times, we'd have an extra 30 mils. Times of water use efficiency of 20 kilograms per hectare gives us 0.6 of a tonne of wheat, times $200 per tonne of wheat. Gives us, what, $120, I think? I might not have done those maths exactly right, but, but that, that starts to then say, look, there's a whole economic side to this in addition to the carbon accounting side, and is it right to take that carbon accounting side and look at it by itself? Probably not. What should really be done is that modeling should be done more holistically and try and define what is the monetary impact of increasing the soil carbon on the production side, bring that together with the carbon accounting, and that gives you your true economic position going forward on the basis of building carbon. But we're, uh, I think we're still a ways off in being able to make that quantitative link between the roles that carbon has in soils, translating that all the way through to a production gain. Um, Jeff, I was just wondering, um, regarding burning stubble residues, um, it's a process that's, that's required quite often in our area, particularly after last season and, and with the flood events, a lot of burning going on. I was just wondering about um, the impact on, on stored soil carbon uh, from burning stubble residues. And it's really going to be a function of the intensity of, well, first off, um, if we burn the carbon 
that carbon doesn't have a chance to f be the energy that drives our soil microorganisms and everything else. So you are having an immediate loss of carbon that would have normally found its way through the soil. Uh, on burning, you've probably got somewhere around about a 2 to 3 percent, maybe, conversion to charcoal. So you're leaving a bit of that longer-lived stuff behind. But when you do the mass balance on how much charcoal might exist in the soils, it's a drop in the bucket, really. I was just wondering if it was possible that it could be looked at as part of the regulation process for right. monitoring carbon. Yeah. Um, I suspect it probably won't get in as part of a regulation process. Um, it will always... So carbon, there's a couple of reasons why. The first one is that soil carbon in the CFI methodology will be traded retrospectively. So there's not going to be, if there's any um, uh, forecast type trading or like a futures, I guess that's a futures type. I'm not an economist, so if I say something wrong, pull me up. But it won't be like forward selling grain. It'll always be retrospective. And because it'll always be retrospective, it'll probably be based on an evidence base from soil analyses. So irrespective of what the management practices the person employed, it'll be the change in soil carbon that'll be traded, not necessarily what was done. Now, I'll back up on one step on that. What was done is important because there's a rule in the carbon trading called additionality, which means you have to be doing something that you would not have otherwise done.